All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll get started in just a second, but I thought we'd do some intros first. Uh, my name is Laura Green. I'm the Director of System Sales and Installations here at Kinetic Lighting, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jennifer Skinner. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Skinner, like she said, and uh, I'm the Director of Sales and Rentals here at Kinetic for Theater. Um, Kinetic is so honored to have these two with us today. Uh, here's a little backstory on Kinetic. Kinetic's been around since 2003. We provide theatrical and studio lighting services to clients throughout the world in studio, corporate, exhibit, theater, and live event markets. While we remain focused on lighting, our range of services is diverse and includes equipment, rentals, sales, lighting design, repairs, previs, and uh, related show services. Um, so we're here today to talk to lighting designers Jeff Rabbits and Jim Moody about the release of their new book, Lighting for Televised Live Events. A uh, little introductions on them. Uh, Jeff Rabbits is an Emmy-winning lighting designer, lecturer, writer specializing in live entertainment being captured for multi-camera television broadcasts and webcasts. Jeff has de designed concert tours for Bruce Springsteen, Steely Dan, John Mellencamp, Styx, and Ringo Starr, among many others, as well as numerous TV specials for award shows, music-based programs, stand-up comedy, fashion, ice shows, debates, and interviews, as well as game shows, talk shows, and specialty scenes for feature films. <laughs> Jeff has been broadcast lighting advisor to the Coachella and Lollapalooza festivals and he was named a Parnelli Lighting Designer of the Year. His design firm, Intensity Advisors, is based in LA, so he's basically done it all. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim Moody has 50 years in the entertainment lighting industry, theater, musicals, concert touring, TV, theme parks, corporate and architectural lighting design. Highlights were John Denver and Eagles Tours and many others. He served as Director of Photography for Entertainment Tonight, Jeopardy, and Wheel of Fortune. Uh, in education, he, has ha um, he was head of design at the Los Angeles Theater Academy for 12 years. He has published six books already, The Business of Theatrical Design uh, and Concert Lighting. Oh, two of those and four of Concert Lighting. Now retired on his yacht at Channel Islands, California, and an expert at margarita making. Excellent. <laughs> so thank you so much You've for being been here. holding out on me, Jim. <laughs> I don't know about that last skill. Wow. Right? That's important. That should go to the top of the uh, resume. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks, guys, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, so just some questions for you about your book. And then if anybody else here has questions, go ahead and uh, type it in the comments section, and we'll read aloud your question and get it answered for you. Uh, so guys, how did the idea for the book come about? Well, uh, actually, it came about from my wife uh, thinking that I needed to find a topic for my next book, and she was the one that suggested Jeff. Uh, Jeff and I have been friends for 30 years and had a business together, of course, and uh, in, uh, uh, actually two light lighting companies, uh, Moody Rabbits Hollingsworth and Visual Terrain. Uh, before we uh, kind of went our separate ways, I into education and Jeff into uh, more television work and that. But uh, it was a, a partnership that just kind of fell into itself uh, uh, because we already had, had a great connection uh, design-wise, personal, personal uh, feeling-wise, and so it just happened. Yeah, it was a natural thing. Um, you know, I had never written a book before. I've, I've written a lot of proposals and articles and so forth. And um, when Jim uh, asked me, I was honored a little, uh, it was a little breathtaking because I was thinking, where do you even begin? But uh, Jim really, you know, kind of coached me through the whole process. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, a real learning experience. I mean, this is, this is something absolutely new um, <laughs> to write a book. A lot of new emotions, a lot of new fears. Well, and how did, uh, how did the ideas for the book come about? Like what you were writing about? 
Well, we sat down and came up with some chapter ideas and uh, that I started and then Jeff added to it. Then we went back and forth. We ended up dropping, I think, three chapters that we originally thought we would have uh, to get the book more in line and consolidated correctly. So it's a process of uh, you know, a little bit of hit and miss and a little bit of you know, soul searching of what we really want to say. Uh, and we both equally uh, contributed to that. And then you know, and the title, uh, the, like talk about the, the title, Lighting for Televised Live Events. What are you referring to by televised live events? So that's, that's a show that would uh, be a normal uh, live performance were it not for the presence of cameras and a TV crew. Um, and so, you know, you have a live audience, you've got a show on stage, uh, but you add the television component and millions of viewers, uh, some of them are actually paying viewers just, you know, based on pay-per-view or subscriptions mm -hmm. or, or uh, just making uh, advertising revenue for the broadcasters. So there's, you know, there is money involved and some advantages, you know, financially. So for that reason, and since millions of people might be seeing it, it may be worth the effort to make things look a little better for that viewer that can only see what you're showing them on a screen or a device. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we talk, you know, televised live events, what are those? Um, concerts, awards shows, uh, stand-up comedy, uh, theatrical things like dance, opera, or, or plays, um, and anything like that. Great. Very cool. Um, so let's talk about the uh, subtitle of your book for a minute. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, it is Making Your Live Production Look Great for the Eye and Camera. So what's the premise behind that? And why would lighting for camera be different than lighting for, for the eye, for like a live performance? Jeff came up with that uh, subtitle, and I think it's very appropriate to, for people to understand it's not just about uh, camera, and it's not just about the live performance, but how do you meld the two together? Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, you know, when you think about it, no camera can really compete with what the human eye can do. It gets closer all the time, but it's still not really there. Right. Uh, you know, the eye can see super bright things and super dark things all sort of in the same field of view. The camera has a harder time resolving that, you know, to a certain degree. The eye can see all kinds of colors the camera has trouble with certain colors and certain things look different on camera, you know, color wise than, than they do in real life without a lot of adjustment. And every time you make an adjustment, you might lose something somewhere else in the spectrum. So it's still kind of, you know, kind of a, a work in progress. And um, uh, when you think about it, um, you know, the viewer at, on a, at a TV show is always sitting in the front row. You know, you've got a, um, you've got a sort of a nose to nose point of view, and so the close up, which doesn't really exist in live shows, unless you're, you know, you are in the front row, and even then, not as close as when you're watching on TV. That can really reveal a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of the flaws. Uh, uh, one bad angle, and you've got something that's not very flattering on a, uh, on a performer. You know, one um, uh, sort of misstep with intensity, you know, could be a little too bright or a little too dark for the camera. So that's what we're talking about. Make your show look good for the eye and the camera. But the premise is really that if it's done right and if it's done with a certain amount of sensitivity, you can make it look excellent for the live audience as well as for the camera. And that's kind of the... Um, uh, the concept that we're espousing here, that if it's done right, the live audience doesn't really know that this show has been, you know, possibly adjusted for the camera. And uh, what will the reader learn from this book that is any different from what we learn from a book on cinematography or theater lighting or other books about television lighting techniques? Well, first of all, let's face it, the whole premise of large screen video magnification is relatively new. And uh, the people in the film industry, as well as uh, uh, theater, especially, 
not so much in concerts because we've had large screens uh, being projected uh, in concerts for quite a while. But these people may be experts in their field, but this is a new addition to what they're doing. And uh, setting up the cameras so that uh, the large screens that are either attached to the show or are part of the show, which is being done a lot on Broadway, is very important and it's a new tech set of techniques for these people and you know this is this is a really specialized corner of, mm -hmm. of the entertainment industry you know live shows and so you know we've got shows that have audiences and they've got you know hundreds of cues and this is different from you know what a um uh, you might learn in a book about cinematography. I mean, there's a lot of techniques that all of those have in common between photography, cinematography, videography, studio lighting, all of that. But the similarities kind of end when you're looking at a live production with hundreds of cues and that's you know put together the way we know a live show is put together, but then still needs some tweaking for, for the camera. And you know, these days also the aesthetics that you would learn in a show uh, in a book about studio lighting or cinematography are going to be a lot different than the aesthetics for a live show because don't forget we're trying to retain the essence of that live show and that might have some rough edges it's just the way you smooth those edges so you don't lose the essence of what the the design had initially but still make it work for the camera and again it's those people that see nothing but what's on the screen. They don't have a, a frame of reference other than what you're showing them. Definitely. So kind of going off of that, I think a concern for a lot of people would be um, that they're they're losing that that natural excitement of the, the show. Mm -hmm. So will these techniques make a live show look more like a, a newsroom or something? Or is there a danger of stripping away um, the the live production visuals that go with um, the exciting nature of having a live show. Well, yeah. I hope not. Yeah, um, I mean, really, uh, I think if it's done with sensitivity um, and an understanding of the psychology, I think I'm kind of qualified to talk about the psychology of it because there was a time in my career when I was the live show designer that welcomed in um you know either willingly or uh or involuntarily you know the uh the tv crew would come in and uh you know the in the early days when people really didn't understand what that kind of crossover was between live and um and and televised entertainment these crews would come in without a lot of live show experience they might have just done a you know a commercial uh or they might have done you know a, a film uh, all with very different standards and aesthetics so they would of course um kind of over sanitize the show they would strip the color out they would change the angles it would it seem to be a lot less drama i think um, if th these days, if done correctly, and that's kind of what we spent a lot of time talking about in the book, you can make minor adjustments, subtle adjustments, still keep what the essence of the show is, and yet make it a lot more palatable for the camera. Does that sound right, Jim? Yep. Absolutely. Uh, especially in theater where, let's face it, we're used to watching it from a limited angle. Mm -hmm. And now you put in cameras that are going to do cross shots, uh, wide shot, and all these things that uh, the tricks that the, the video can bring to it. Uh, but you don't want to lose the essence of what the play is or the musical uh, excitement. So adding what we're talking about in the book can supplement what those designs are mm -hmm. without taking away from the essence of uh, their uh, original work. I mean, all in all, if you think about it, the the TV audience um, kind of has an advantage over the live audience. Yeah, they're not there in the room, sort of breathing the air with the uh, with the performer, and there, there's no substitute for that. We're not we're not trying to say that, but you get to see angles, you get to see close ups, and all sorts of things that the um, the in house audience doesn't get. But right. those 
those angles have to be lit too. And it needs to be interesting when you've got a cross shot, like Jim said, you might be looking into the wings. And if it's just, you know, kind of a dark nothing back there, it suddenly becomes not quite that, you know, much of a pleasing shot. So, you know, we sort of learn how to effectively add a few things here and there that make every angle work. Great. Uh, is it, that, what's funny about that is because you break up the book into different sections like the science, the art, uh, the equipment, the production. What um, can you expand on that? Like, what made you do that? Well, it's the logic of the uh, what we're trying to say goes from uh, one to the other. But one of the things that's in the book that is new uh, to all those other types of books is the chapters on the equipment, the cameras, the screens, the uh, projectors, uh, what is out there. And that stuff is changing so rapidly. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the cameras, we only talk about three cameras because there are actually 11 companies building high definition very sophisticated cameras now that are approaching what the film camera can do. So the idea is yeah, not- Ultra high definition. <laughs> ultra high definition is right. So we're not trying to make them technicians, but we want the line designer to have enough knowledge. So when they sit in a production meeting and somebody says, oh yeah, we're gonna use the red camera this, or we're gonna do this Sony camera, they have a sense of what kind of light levels uh, those cameras can produce for them. And uh, what the uh, lenses, for instance, that are available for them might be uh, suggesting that the LD uh, brings into the picture. So that's a big part of what we're trying to do too. And yeah. an understanding that, that, you know, they need to do a little bit of homework outside. Yeah, these are not like deep technical treatises on, on these topics. They're uh, enough to get anybody that's interested in knowing you know, the circuitry and the nuts and bolts and everything else, they can dig into it. There are plenty of places and we didn't have to copy and paste all of the technical documents off of the Red and Sony and ARRI uh, websites. You know, that's all there and available to them. But the book in general kind of has a flow to it that starts with, you know, with what we think is the science where we're unlocking a lot of the terms that are uh, that are somewhat specific to our corner of the business. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, kind of explain in more detail how the camera does see differently than the eye. And then, you know, things that are a, mis a mystery to a lot of people that haven't worked in uh, TV or with the camera about F-stops and exposure and things like that. And then we kind of progress into the art of it where we talk about color. And, you know, needless to say, there is a lot about color, it's uh, such an important topic in television lighting of any sort. But again, we're dealing with you know uh, uh, performances that might use you know really strong brash color, and uh, and there's color correction that needs to be done, and there are all all sorts of uh, discussions about that and balance balance composition and then we do talk about the equipment as as jim said and then eventually and we go into some detail about um uh about led walls and projectors and things like that but just enough to give you a, a taste of it and then we go into production where we talk we have case histories by uh respected designers out there that talk about situations that they've they've been in and um uh, and then um, uh, we talk about things like the TV truck and so forth. So we think that there's like somewhat of a progression uh, of of educating the reader. Yeah. Um. So so going off of that, um, besides lighting for televised events, what else does the book cover? Well, as I said, there there is we do touch on projection because LED screens are sort of ever present now, and lighting uh, a show that has LED screens in them is uh, a science unto itself, and um, and so we do talk about that, and then you know we go into a, a, a little bit of detail just about the history of screens and so forth, just a few interesting tidbits and facts, and uh, and about projectors and. Uh, and projection screens and reflectance and so forth. Um, and, 
Uh, we talk about the TV truck uh, and the uh, sort of television environment that uh, people will find themselves in that they may not be familiar with if they've never experienced, you know, working on, on a show like that before. Is that where you sit in the television, in the truck? We sit in the truck. I mean, some, yeah. Yeah, it's not always in a truck. It might be in an actual dedicated room in a studio, uh, you know, built-in room, or it could be um, a fly pack system, which is just a big portable control room that they bring in with all the other equipment and set right. it up in some corner of the building. So yeah, but all of those, it's the same thing. That's where, you know, the uh, TV lighting designer is suddenly going to be, you know, part of that, that little community in that, in that truck and the there's a lot to know just about how that works because I would imagine it, it, it's, it's like being uh uh you know plucked from the womb when yeah. you have to <laughs> leave the Very house desk and go into that truck and you how am i going to do that you know wow do you, you know, do it's you there any, on here do you have any um yeah. to both of you do you have any is, are there any like real life production situations that you bring up in the book? Yeah, yeah, um, uh, several. Oh, really? We've you know we've got um, uh, guest uh, contributors that uh, that talk about their experiences, and those are really interesting, and you know some high level production. And then there are um, sort of examples peppered through the whole book, you know. And, uh, j just to sort of give a little bit of credence to the concepts we're talking about. No, that's that's very helpful to the reader too. Like just to, oh, to, to have a little fun and, and get a little bit of a story on background. There's lots of romance in the book. And, uh, <laughs> we do reveal a few things. We don't, we have changed the names. Now, one of the things that uh, I think we should mention that came up uh, with some other people that have read uh, parts of the book that it's a really readable book. We're not trying to do an academic testes right. on, uh, to, uh, on uh, the subject. We want people to read it and get something from it. And I think if the audience there is worried about that this is gonna be too scholarly or something, uh, that that's not what we're talking about here. It's something that you can use on a daily basis. That's a great point. And I would also think that uh, people that aren't even in the lighting part of it, but that are in the TV live experience part of it, costume designers, they, you know, they could find value in something like this. Well, I've always said, yes, I, I think so. Sure. In, in theater, we sit in a production meeting right. with a costumer, with a set designer, with a special effects person, director. All you need as a line designer to understand at least an understand, a rough understanding about what each of these people do and how your work is going to affect them. Well, this is now just another layer of that. Somebody says we're bringing in the red camera to do a, uh, a shoot of this thing. At least you need to understand what's a red camera. It's a, it's a company. Okay, what do they have? All right, I can look it up now, but at least I have some basic knowledge and I don't look you know, stupid sitting right, in the exactly. production meeting. Well, just it's like the lighting designer wants to be able to interface with the set designer and the costume designer on color mm -hmm. and all sorts exactly. of things, those people also should be wanting to interface with the lighting designer for the same reason. They have a vested interest in making sure we do it right. And when television is involved, it's a whole different story. And they are going to want to make sure the colors that they use are TV friendly and, uh, and, and so forth. So, you know, we're kind of aiming this at those professionals. We're aiming it at uh, college students. Any student could be high school student. High school students are so much more sophisticated and advanced yeah. than they were in, in, in when I was there. So uh, I know that many of them are already forming, you know, sharp and clear ideas about what they what they want to do in the business. But and then, of course, grad students, anybody that either wants to know more about uh, about the topic, uh, just so that they can uh, know a little bit of everything in the business, or maybe they are, they would even want to specialize it and, in it. And then there are those lighting professionals that are strictly stage lighting designers that might want to know a little more so that when the TV crew comes in, they can be a collaborator and they can be a real asset to the team Absolutely. instead of uh, being brushed aside or uh, 
you know, or, or being an adversary, you know, the more you know, the more accepting you can be of the process. And when you have a vested interest in making sure your show gets translated, you want to be on the good side of those people. And they want to be on, they truly do want to be on the good side of the show lighting designer. Uh, but sometimes it just, you know, the sparks fly. We don't want that to happen. So, and, my, and my, then, son, my son is a gaffer in film. And he's come to me uh, several times on commercials that he's doing where now you're seeing these huge backgrounds that are now no longer painted. They're projections. And, you know, he had to get knowledge uh, to know how to light those because the DP is just going to say, I want this. I want it to contrast between the car and the background at this level. Well, he's responsible for coming up with the lighting gear that it's going to do that. So he needed to know more and more about how these uh, projections are done. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Um. So looking at your your chapter list, um, looks like there are chapters on adapting a live show and one on made for TV. So what's what's the difference between those two? Jeff. So, well, adapting a show is taking a show that's already been designed and uh, and executed for um, live live production, um, but then uh, adapting the show, which may be scheduled for um, for a, a television special or a shoot. Sometimes it's only for archival, but assuming that it's uh, you know a show that's being um, uh, tailored for a TV shoot, coming in and making all those adjustments uh, that that need to happen so that the live show looks good on television and also still maintains the original look. Made for TV, that's a show that starts from scratch as uh, a show that's being designed for television. So everything, all the angles, all the color, all the intensities, et cetera, et cetera, are all uh, planned with the uh, the camera in mind and all the, mu the multi-cameras in mind. And so there are no excuses, uh, uh, but also, you might have many, many logistical challenges, and um, that's the time to nip it in the bud when you're designing it in in the first place. Um, I'm I'm interested in how in the world you collaborated during the pandemic. Ah, this is uh, we didn't have an office together anymore. So Jeff lives in Studio City here in Southern California, and I'm about 50 miles away up the coast at uh, Channel Islands, which is actually Oxnard, California. The Oxnard brothers uh, formed the city. Uh, and uh, so we actually had two offices. Uh, we had a deli in Studio City that we met at, and we had a deli in Channel Islands. Uh, <laughs> that, that was met at. Yeah, that was pre-pandemic. But uh, yeah, yeah, when we had, had after the pandemic, you know, as um, um, as it was mentioned, Jim lives on a yacht, and so um, during the pandemic, I would uh, canoe up next <laughs> to the yacht. He would sort of open the porthole, and we would have a meeting, and then I would just sort of go away. Yeah, yeah. and I'd so, have. Yeah. It to make sure it was legitimate. No, uh, we did a lot on uh, emails, a lot of phone, long phone calls. But again, because we had been together for all these years, we had so much of a feeling for re what each other was doing that when we would provide uh, uh, writings from uh, one chapter to another, uh, it was very easy to just say, okay, I, I think you got it here, but maybe you should add this or maybe take out this. And there was really no conflict that way. It was a very fluid uh, process. It ultimately took about three years because we signed our contracts and got all of that stuff out of the way in 2018. And we began outlining the chapters. Uh, and so we had all of 2019 and a little bit of 2020. So by the time the pandemic hit, we already had a lot of momentum. And as I said, Jim and I have been working together for so many years, doing it on the phone and on uh, uh, via email wasn't the best way to do it, but we were able to, to be pretty effective. We were set up in a place that it was, you'd already got the mm -hmm. outline. 
dug yeah. into the real stuff. But. Right, right. Then it was just, you know, writing, 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 photos, 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 you know, graphics and illustrations and, you know, everything that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of solitary work too. Yeah, I got to say that, uh, uh, what's it, the uh, publisher? Uh, oh, Rutledge, I, Rutledge. Rutledge, I, because they got, they bought Focal Press, which is who the concert books were written for. But Rutledge was really supportive uh, gave us uh, the flexibility when we needed some time to get some more graphics done, uh, Jeff's schedule of work. Uh, the, they're very, very helpful. And I think you, uh, everybody should, and the price, which you're going to talk about, is amazing uh, that they've come up with for the book. Uh, so uh, give them a lot of support. They do a lot of good books. Well, that's good. Awesome. So uh, for those who don't know, uh when is the book available and where? And uh, how can people get it? And how much? Yeah, and how much? <laughs> um, well, it's uh, uh, going to be released on uh, May 31st, which is Memorial Day um, yes. here in the States. And um, uh, it can be gone. I don't think it's going to be in any, uh, you know, brick and mortar stores. That's, uh, uh, you, you may know Jim, but I know that it's available online from, uh, the Rutledge website. Um, you can just put, uh, you know, lighting for televised live events in their search and it comes, comes right up. Uh, and, uh, Amazon and, uh, Barnes and Noble and all of the various other booksellers that, um, that, that, you know, trade in these sorts of things. Um, I think maybe at the trade shows, when we do have trade shows again, a lot of them have bookshops uh, as part of the trade show. And I think they will be physically available there. I found yeah. out last week when I was looking on the website that uh, there's actually going to be an E version of it. I'm really excited about that because I didn't realize that they were going to do that. And, um, Personally, that's my favorite way way to read th these days. So I was really happy to see it. I, I don't know how it's formatted, but it should be pretty cool. Uh, and there's a hardback. That's the most expensive. That's you know north of a hundred bucks. But then, and I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. But uh, at least for the time being, uh, there's a twenty percent uh, discount. I think until the beginning of July. Um, I know one other place that's going to be selling it. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Kinetic we Lighting. Go on, Jen. Yes, you can yeah. get it at Kinetic Lighting. We're going to have it at our shop and on our website to buy. So right. I just want to mention that. Oh, yeah. fantastic! Thank you. Yes, KineticLighting.com. And I think the uh, the price after uh, May thirty first is thirty nine ninety five, isn't it, Jeff? You know, I'm not sure. I I, I think the actual the discount uh, one. Yeah, yeah, the discount one. Uh, oh for yeah until until july excellent uh, so get them now <laughs> well this is a good this is a good birthday present it's a good you know just a great way to introduce especially for students and now that students are getting out of school it's a great time for them to be able to read something like this yeah totally um, and it's, it's really heavy so it's a good door <laughs> it makes a good door, door stop too there you go well, that segues us nicely into uh, some questions that people are asking here on Facebook. So if anyone else has questions, feel free to type them in, but we'll just kind of go down the line and uh, yeah. get people's questions answered. Um, so first question, is your book written more for the live event LD with limited to no television experience or for television LDs that may not have as much live event experience? Both. I knew you were going to say that. I think it's more, I think it's for uh, live, uh, uh, for design uh, folks that do have live experience so that we presume that you understand what lighting is all about and how you would light a show and we take it from there. Uh, but I also think that, uh, that it would be perfect for somebody that has scratched the surface into TV. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, and take uh, it the rest uh, of the way. It's not. It's not as much for somebody who is already a top of the line working LD. We probably mm -hmm. aren't going to tell anybody anything they don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I it's think there's a couple, areas, there's a couple areas that will be a little bit more effective. That's 
maybe corporate meetings, uh, theater, musicals, uh, the people that work in those areas that don't have uh, any background at all uh, other than in those live medias, mediums will uh, benefit greatly from the book. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a, um, a great question here that I'm interested in here is, does your book break down what might be, um, this is from Hannah Kerman, uh, does your book break down what might be the role of various people that work on the actual lighting team? Didn't really do a lot on that, I don't think, Jeff. Well, I'm, you know, we 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 do talk about, you know, obviously, you know, the, the lighting designer, but no, I, I, we do mention the gaffer and so forth. Uh, we don't go into a lot about the assistants and the associates' roles and things like that. Awesome. Uh, so next question is from uh, Keith Dixon. Uh, would corporate clients which want to expand their production knowledge benefit from the book or is information more directly targeted to industry professionals? No, I personally think that they would benefit greatly. Uh, I think that it's readable in that respect. It's, you know, it's written in a way that, uh, you know, that can be digested and understood uh, by, you know, anybody that's, you know, uh, that, that's some, got some sense of what production is all about. Uh, I'd say if you had zero idea of what production was all about, you might find it interesting, but you wouldn't be able to re relate to a lot of the uh, references in the book as much. So I think somebody like that, a, a director or a producer, I think they could find it extremely helpful in understanding what goes on, you know, with uh, the lighting of that show. Yeah, I think that's important all around. Like we were just talking about with working together, you know, anybody should be reading this that works in this field. Um, M Entertainment Group has a question. Are there any explanations in the book with how to, de how to deal with different frame rates of cameras and fixture modes to make them flicker free? No. Uh, again, that goes into the technical area that we did not want to overdo the, uh, that there's books on that already uh, that are available. So that wasn't a primary function of the book. Yeah, we don't go into that uh, deeply. There are references to the fact that, uh, you know, especially uh, with LEDs, there is uh, yeah, uh, a right. discussion about, uh, you know, about frame rate and about syncing um, your, your camera and your screen. It also uh, relates to the screens and the, the LEDs. Um, with uh, you know, with the cameras and the lights, so the, there is there is reference to it, but it does not go into a how to. Got it. Um, let's see. So, uh, Bud Horowitz uh, is asking, even in corporate events that aren't being televised or even on IMAG, but are being shot for archival purposes, <coughs> um, you know that CEOs are going to look at the videos. They better look good. So I guess it wasn't so More much of a statement. A statement. Sorry, <laughs> I'll get you a different question. But uh, but it's real. You know, I'll just kind of tag on to that. Yeah, it's true. And one of the uh, sort of areas that we do say that we're aiming towards is uh, the uh, the LD that's lighting for an IMAG screen uh, or just for archive because it is important. And even on the IMAG screen, it's it's important that the person who is watching that show from the back row of a stadium or an arena also gets a, a balanced uh, picture. Uh, so there's a lot uh, that uh, that would benefit those people. And I think it's extremely important. Even if you consider the fact that if a show is not being televised at all, it is being televised because these days, uh, 15 minutes after the show, it's going to be up on <laughs> YouTube or Instagram or somebody's website uh, from their phone. And, uh, you know, the phones are getting better. Phone cameras are getting better all the time. But there are, you know, auto iris issues and things like that that just kind of make it not a really perfect uh, reproduction of the show. The better the lighting is, the better it will be. And then, you know, there is something to be said 
and maybe this is kind of self-serving on my part to say it, but there's something to be said for good. It, it, once you get a show kind of tweaked for good TV lighting, there is a chance that it actually will be cleaner and make make all the statements that you would want to make, but it's a little bit more balanced. So, um, you know, everybody's going to have their own opinion about that. But I think if you do it, you do it correctly, you can, you can improve almost any show. And do you discuss from, from Sam Molitaris, do you discuss tips for collaborating with shaders? Yeah, there's a lot in, about that. And uh, I would, I would imagine not everybody knows what a shader is. A shader is the video controller. Shader is kind of a slang term, but it's the video controller who is the engineer uh, that calibrates all the cameras and then sp during the show is operating the uh, exposure for all the cameras, the iris, and they have color control and various other things that uh, make them uh, your partner. Mm -hmm. when you want them to be out. your best friend because they can sabotage you or they can make you look real good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there, there's quite a lot of reference in there about the shader. Yeah, no, that's good to know. And um, uh, there's just a, a little joke here from John Gresh that I don't want to miss. How do you, how do you autograph those who decide to get an ebook? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I'll I'll uh, uh, email you a digital signature. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so we were just speaking of phones and how everyone is uh, filming everything with their camera phones these days. So Bud Horowitz had a uh, follow up to that um, saying, speaking of phones, how do you balance between camera and phones? Uh, he is an artist that watches uploaded phone videos all the time. So do you, you know, make it for that really great, you know, high def camera or do you make it for, for people's iPhones? Well, look, if you've got high def cameras in the room, uh, because the show is being shot for those, then that's kind of what your your uh, priority is going to be. But I think that if you get it good for the uh, for the high def cameras, you're getting it good for for the iPhone. What is the problem generally with the iPhone? If you look at the iPhone videos that I see a lot on online, just the live, you know, from the balcony, from the main floor, whatever. Um, it's the imbalance. It's the fact that one person on stage is three times brighter because they've got four follow spots on them. Nobody else has any follow spots or, or everyone else has one or, you know, you get the idea. It's just not, it, it might be balanced for the eye and the eye can take it. That's the whole point. The camera can't. So that's why you see one person, the, ca the, the, the iPhone camera chooses what it's going to balance for. And if most of the stage is at one level and one guy is three times brighter, it's going to probably balance for the darker, you know, broader area. And that one guy is going to just look nuclear like a, you know, like a snowball on, yeah. on camera. Uh, and, uh, and there's all different variations of that, you know, where, where certain parts of the stage go too dark because the iPhone is exposing automatically for the brighter person on stage. So I think if you get it all balanced, that that doesn't happen to the iPhone nearly as uh, as strongly as it might have otherwise. Does that make sense, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, uh, does anyone have any other questions before we uh, wrap up? Go ahead and type them in. Um, but is there anything else, uh, Jeff and Jim, that you guys wanted people to know or anything else you wanted to mention about the book? Uh, I think we've covered it pretty well. Jim? Yeah, I'm trying to, trying to think if we've left anything out. Um, you know, I will say, you know, you read, you, you write a book like this and it's kind of a curse because you think of things um, daily. Oh. <laughs> after, the book, after the book is in, I got something from the publisher a week or so ago saying, the book is out to print. And that's pretty much the steel door comes down. I can no longer sneak in the millions of little last minute changes that I was probably getting under their skin doing. And, uh, and that's it. And then you think, why didn't I add this? Why didn't I say that? Um, I could have phrased this just a little differently. It's a curse, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's um, 
uh, edition two. <laughs> sure. And somebody's going to say, well, why didn't you do a chapter on X, Y, or Z? Right. Uh, at some point, you have to lock it in and say, this is what we're doing for this time. That's what second editions are for. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, Joel Schumann has a question, but I think we did cover it. Do you talk about the different positions and what they might be between the live entertainment and TV and film? Uh, what the job description differences are between the two fields? Do you, do you have a section on that? You know, that's a really good question. And the same thing about all, all, all the other positions on the show. And uh, probably don't talk as much about that. In the uh, chapter on the TV truck, there is a description and explanation of everybody that's in the TV truck, which is a lot of the primary people that are that's working awful. on the show. We don't necessarily break down the lighting team that much into uh, designer, assistant, associate, pro. We do talk about the programmer, uh, but um, you know those are um, not. Yeah, I mean they're they're perfectly legitimate topics to talk about. We probably don't expound on it as much as we could have, and then we don't compare those roles between film, between film and theater, and, yeah. and studio, and and our sort of live world. We don't. Mm -hmm. do that. Version two, like that's the follow up book. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Or yeah. when I come to your school and talk, I'll. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one thing that we that we did leave out, we didn't we didn't really talk about some of the examples of uh, productions, and uh, I thought I'd just mention this one. Uh, while I was at LACC, I worked with a set designer, Atashi Yamamura, uh, who had some experience with video uh, projection before he designed for us, and we did a couple of shows, 1984 which you know has the voice and we brought in a head uh, using video uh, for that show that he designed. And then we got one of the directors got real bold and said, well, wait a minute, I've got this film script. I want to do it as a play. And if anybody understands film, you know, you cut and you cut and you cut. Same thing with television. You don't stay on a, a single shot the way a play would be done uh, when you're just watching it from the audience. And uh, the two of us got together and said, well, wait a minute, how do we do this? We, don't, we can't build this many sets. They can't move in and out quick enough. The only way to do it is with video walls. So we built the whole set was video walls. And uh, the uh, uh, problem of balancing between the walls from one environment to another to another uh, was interesting doable but interesting and what light level did you use on the stage for the live audience and these things are something that can be done relatively easily if you just put some effort into it and do some little experimenting uh it goes to the material you use for the screens because we do in the book talk about the different uh, uh acceptance angles of material that you can use for screens. And that's very important. Do you have a wide audience or is your audience more contained? Uh, so you would pick a material that would go to uh, giving you the brightest uh, output in those environments. So there is something that the light designer has to get involved in with the, uh, even with the presentation of the video or slides in this case of these different environments. Awesome. Um, so our, our last question before we wrap up today uh, comes from uh, Rachel Miller. Um, aside from lighting designers, who do you wish would read it to become more educated? Gaffers, cinematographers, directors, producers, students, etc. cetera. Totally, totally. I mean, this is uh, a, a really excellent book for gaffers to read and master electricians and, uh, you know, every everyone on the live uh, live show lighting team. Uh, even the guitar tech should read it because they just, exactly. <laughs> uh, but no, um, uh, I, I think that it's, it's written broadly enough so that all of those people can gain an understanding of what goes on and can be then be helpful. And uh, of course, a lot of master electricians and gaffers also find themselves in positions of designing shows. They may wish to, it's not, you know, not necessary, but um, you know, they um, uh, may find themselves sliding into that role and 
the more they know earlier on, as opposed to uh, buying the book uh, two days before they have to uh, light something. Well, yeah. uh, well I just want to, yeah. especially with the gaffer, especially with the gaffer, because he is taking the direction of the director of photography, who probably knows nothing about the equipment in the first place. Uh, he's just telling the gaffer what he wants the uh, final look to be, and the gaffer's yeah. got to do that. Good point. And you know what? Directors of photography will find this very interesting too. There may yeah. be some things in there that they already know, but there's an awful lot about what what goes into it. You know, I work with a lot of directors of photography and sometimes they just let me sort of go on my merry way. Sometimes they want to really know what I'm doing step by step. And sometimes they want to take over and sort of do what what I'm hired to do. I think the more they were, they understand this, the more they collaborate with us and use us. And you know, the best experiences that I've had with directors of photography have been those where we're collaborating and sort of interweaving our abilities. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, say it one more time. The name of the book is? Lighting for Televised okay. Live Events, Making Your Live Production Look Good for the Eye and the Camera. And it's available May 31st, and you can get it at Kinetic Lighting uh, on our website, or it, uh, we will be selling it at our store as well at Kinetic Lighting. Fantastic. Can't thank you enough for doing, doing that, uh, Jen and Laura, and everyone at Kinetic. Thanks for putting this together. Yep. Thank, thank you. We're you so excited. Yes, Jim? Thank you. And, thank you. you know, uh, I, I, um, a lot of people uh, that have any ongoing questions, uh, you know, I can be reached. My, my website is intensityadvisors.com. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions um, and uh, anything that you think wasn't covered, but you want to chat about, uh, anything in the book that you want to take issue with, whatever. <laughs> and of course, if you uh, have any questions for Kinetic, you can get us at info at kineticlighting.com. And my, because uh, uh, I don't have a company anymore as I'm retired, it's just James Moody, LD, Lima Dog at gmail.com. And like Jeff, I'm always open to, uh, to uh, students to ask questions. Uh, I get every once in a while somebody's doing a paper uh, uh, for their class, and I don't mind at all taking the time to talk to anybody that That's awesome. has a question. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. And have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.